Hi, everybody. Welcome to the 7 and 7 show with Zach Ellison. Today, I have with me Dan Zwern, one of the world's best credit investors and the CEO of Arena Investors, which is a $3.5 billion credit-focused hedge fund. Dan, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's great to see you. Um, yeah, I think you've done some amazing things in your career, and I'd love to have you explain to the audience how you got here. Well, uh, thanks again. Uh, I think um, I've always been as much an investor as an entrepreneur. And so fairly early on, I started thinking about um, how to how to be an, an entrepreneur within the investment world. And in the early 90s, I um, was reading quite a bit about kind of financial history and thinking about how people created edge uh, in, in durable franchises within the investment world over time. And in 1995, kind of wrote a plan uh, to do that, focused on <clears throat> the question of what makes an investment business a good business. And, and having thought it through and, and looked at a lot of successful examples, in many, in every instance, it, it wasn't about, you know, just having a, a person who could kind of pick them uh, in a kind of speculative bet. It was, you know, it was really about accumulating very specific um, access and resources that were um, defendable behind a moat uh, that would give us uh, or give an enterprise in the area a, a sustainable edge. And, you know, we, we came to think about this notion of a global chaser of illiquidity, right? We want to not just, we, we don't want to be a, a really, really smart gambler. We want to be a great casino. Um, and what that means was in our case, thinking about really three factors. Um, one was <clears throat> the ability to avoid what is probably the most dangerous thing for any um, provider of capital, which is moral hazard. Um, and to do so through uh, a flexibility of mandate that allowed you to avoid things that were effectively overdone, overcrowded, uh, and susceptible to that. Uh, number two, um, creating a very kind of differentiated variable cost efficient network um, that was hyper aligned with the interests of the enterprise that would allow us to go and, and create a very, very large funnel um, that we could effectively apply this great risk man you know, um, investment mandate to. And then third, um, really the thinking through kind of, or rethinking through the back of the house and how do you create a differentiated advantage, advantage through um, the administration, servicing, workout, surveillance um, of, uh, uh, of these uh, investments and, and, um, and kind of parenthetically, how do you apply technology to make that as efficient as possible? And so uh, as a result, um, you know, I, I, I tended to, uh, migrate toward the event-driven hedge fund space only because in the 90s, that was really the only place where people had free-flowing mandates to do what made sense and avoid that, which doesn't, which didn't. And through that, you know, gained um, experience in uh, investment areas, including risk arbitrage, distressed debt investing, what is now called direct lending or private lending, asset-based lending, real estate lending, et cetera, and, and did them in geographies uh, across North America, throughout Europe, and, and and Asia as well. And so I started kind of cataloging uh, in my mind, uh, you know, a, a set of permutations of industry product and geography that I would dispassionately compare with one another to kind of find where opportunity was and um, did that uh, at a large scale, what is now a large scale hedge fund uh, called Davidson Kempner, which was about a billion dollars at the time, is now 40 or 50 billion. And then Quickly after that was backed by Michael Dell to kind of build a business from scratch, where I then learned things like how to set up the accounting systems and, uh, you know, hiring and firing and the trading mechanics and all the machinery or some of it, you know, it's a, it's a never, it's a nonstop learning process, certainly. And uh, subsequently built a, a, a second version of that called uh, DB's Warning Company backed by Hybrid, which was later bought by JP Morgan. And then now starting in 2015, the same thing at Arena, uh, which was with whom I've, uh, on which I've partnered with a Canadian holding company called Westname, which is publicly traded under WED space CN on your Bloomberg, uh, where alongside a successful property and casualty insurance business they had, we've kind of built uh, Arena up from, you know, a few people in a, um, a small commitment of capital to where it is today. 
That's great. One of the things that I think you've done really well is, is utilize structure to also generate outperformance as opposed to just uh, company picking or, or sector picking or, or riding momentum. So how do you think about structure and how that can add to generating outperformance? Sure. Well, from my perspective, um, structure is intimately tied to control. Um, you know, we're very focused on what is in and outside of our control. And certainly as, as people who are focused on, on really deep value investing, uh, well, value investing, the, um, the troubling thing about, um, what I've seen in kind of stock oriented value investors is this notion of I've detected value and I'm sitting there looking at value and um, I'm hoping someone will unlock that value, right? Namely the management or board of a given public company. And, you know, that leads to what people call value traps, right? Where you're sitting there uh, owning a, a, a 50 cent dollar and you can't kind of, uh, you know, kind of close the gap, so to speak. And so people end up screaming and shouting and proxy fights and, and letters to the, to the management teams and, you know, going to conferences, touting their investment and why the sum of the parts is so much more valuable than where the stock price is, et cetera, et cetera. There are people who are expert at that. Uh, it's not within our circle of competence. And so we'd much rather use structure to effectively put it all back into our control. And so, uh, you know, when we think about a, a debt instrument or a variety of different kind of structured transactions, we don't really differentiate the notion of debt and equity, right? Because that's those are that's kind of an artificial construct, right? There's a continuum of risk and reward in any asset, um, and there can be multiple participants in that asset in multiple places in that capital structure, and each of them may have very different return for unit of risk based on where they're kind of setting up in that stack. And so the question really about structure is not, am I debt or am I equity, et cetera? It's do I does this structure give me leverage of le leverage in terms of control no matter where I am in the in the in the stack to effectively crystallize value, and so that's what we think about and 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 think about you know when people have to give us information, what information they need to give us, what covenants they might have, what uh, uh, approvals we might have, what discretion we might have, um, you know all the different kind of tools at our disposal to make sure that we no matter where we are in the capital structure, we're really kind of in the driver's seat for the kind of recognition and crystallization of value. And that can happen in, in many different ways and, 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 and also changes depending on what, what industry you're in, what country you're in, what the, regu what the applicable regulatory regime is, the degree to which you're exposed to a publicly traded uh, entity, uh, either you know, traded stock or debt. Um, so there's a lot of um, you know, art versus science in terms of making sure all of those things set up the right way. So what are some of the other key investment principles that, that you live by and that have helped you be successful over the last couple of decades? Uh, I would say a very, very big one, and this came to me from a very smart investor, uh, is alignment, alignment of interest. Um, and, and certainly as Charlie Munger, who just passed away, always said, show me an incentive and I'll show you an outcome. And you know, we have seen innumerable situations where people have put themselves up a tree by giving people all the incentive in the world to put them up that tree. Um, and then they scratch their head and wonder why they are up that tree. Uh, and so, um, you know, what does that translate through uh, to on a day-to-day -day basis? It means things like if I'm in a very difficult jurisdiction, very difficult jurisdiction where, as an example, the system of creditors' rights is limited, but the system of title and ownership isn't. I might say to someone who might who might want who might want to borrow from us, "You're going to sell me that asset, right? And then I'll give you an option to buy it back from us, right? Over time, right? Effectively creating an invest a, a debt style return per unit of risk and structure, but putting all the onus of trust on the counterparty, um, which you know, in a very tough jurisdiction, said counterparty will likely understand because. Um, if they were in our shoes, they'd probably want to do the same thing. And so um, that's just one example. But this this notion uh, where you see folks, as an example, pr providing a doing a dividend recap and and letting an owner of an asset take out all their bait, but leaving you with all the risk and a cap return, that doesn't seem terribly bright, right? Uh, but it happens all the time, right? There are 
arbitrages that very smart investors think about when they are the on the borrowing side, as an example, or contracting side, um, that are created by kind of blips in regulatory uh, rules and infrastructure, different incentives that investors might have to, as an example, accumulate um, assets very rapidly in the absence of a regard for the ultimate return premium risk outcome for their investors, right? And so I, as an issuer, might take advantage of that. And, and as asset and credit investors, you know, we are borrowing as much as we're lending, right? Because, you know, there are lots of people who want to finance us in the investments that we're making. And we're always thinking about both sides of the of that equation. And there are innumerable, again, arbitrage opportunities that arise when you think about all the different things other than return per unit risk that motivate potential providers of capital, including kind of regulatory, uh, arbitrary regulatory rules, um, you know, stakeholder demands, um, uh, uh, even, even uh, you know, different kind of perceptions around the investments that they want to create. They may not want to market, you know, you know, market down. They might want to market up. They want to do all these different things that have nothing to do with, or am, I, am I making a great return for unit of risk? And so if one is on the other side of that, one might trade off some of those things that give these people some these counterparties some non-purely economic utility, so to speak, in return for you know incre increasing our economic utility. That's a great point about alignment. I always think about deals as needing to be fat, fair, aligned, and transparent. That's how mm -hmm. I always you know, think about it. It's very you know very simple. But if they're not those three things, you're usually going to wind up having some fallout along the way. Yeah, and I would say to your point on transparency, uh, we're never getting over on anyone, right? We we actually prefer things where everybody knows everything, right? And we both acknowledge that we're getting an exceptional return per unit of risk, but the other person has some exogenous incentives that they understand they are trading off in order to give us excess economics, and that's perfectly fine, right? Uh, we do encounter folks who attempt to kind of... Um, you know, hide the ball, so to speak. And we never react well to that. Uh, we're never going to be a victim of that. But on top of that, it decreases the credibility of the counterparty if they are kind of going to operate in that manner, right? And so it's just, it's, it's totally unhelpful on all, in, in all ways. And we're not looking to do anything other than make a straightforward transaction. You know, when Buffett, as an example, provided, you know, the, the capital to Occidental, you know, over a weekend, gave them $10 billion in an incredibly low LTV, high return, uh, instrument, you know, they he was getting paid for being able to act over a weekend on ten billion, right? And it was an outrageous return per unit of risk. Everybody understood it. Uh, I think the counterparty was delighted with it, uh, just as GE and Goldman Sachs and others were during 08. Uh, and you know, he got excess return, and they got what they needed. I think the transparency is very key because as long as everything's disclosed. And it's and it's very clear what both sides are are doing. It keeps you out of a lot of potential legal trouble too, in in the sense that if it's there yeah. and it's disclosed, it's it's um it's a nice antiseptic in a sense. I would say it's a condition precedent, but it's not sufficient. Um, if you harken back to 08 again, um, you know, ex post there were, um, there were um, uh, anecdotes about people who sold things to unsuspecting, you know, buyers of mezzanine synthetic tranches, et cetera, when in fact, everybody had the same Intex, uh, you know, runs. Intex, for anyone who doesn't know, is a is a software system that allows you to analyze asset-backed securities in certain ways, right? And, you know, one side just had a view and the other guy had a different view and, you know, one was right, right? Uh, and, and then the, the person who uh, was wrong, then retrospectively, you know, cried, you know, fraud or uh, misrepresentation or misselling, uh, as opposed to they didn't do their homework, and you know, the uh, consequence was logical. I think there's a lot of folks that that after things go bad, they want to blame somebody else. They don't want to take personal responsibility or accountability. Yep, yep, quite a bit of that. <laughs> So in addition to, to fairness and alignment and transparency, what are some of the other in investing principles that have served you well? Well, I think in, in everything we do, 
um, we're always thinking about one of two things. Do I have a, uh, you know, Buffett style five forces moated franchise that is highly free cash flow generative? Um, and, and is the, in parenthetically, am I creating a yield with that uh, post loss on levered cash flow that is appropriately high relative to alternatives and, and risk free, right? And then, or we're looking at understandable assets that are liquidatable, right? And, and furthermore, getting down to the kind of first principles of it, um, you know, a number of people who are asset oriented get stung when they go, well, you know, everybody buys my asset for X and it must be worth X and I'm advancing 0.8 of X, you know, and then suddenly, you know, the assets, assets worth 0.6 of X and everyone goes, well, why, how did that happen? Right. And so the answer of course is every asset only has value insofar as it can produce a post tax on leverage cash flow, right? Otherwise it has no value. There's certainly no economic value. It may warm your heart like gold, right? But it has no intrinsic uh, economic value. And so, uh, you know, get, sticking to that kind of first principle of what yield does this asset or, or, or enterprise or piece of property create? And how does that yield on an unlevered basis compared to all other alternatives, including risk-free? Um, you know, is a great place to start, right? And, you know, I think a lot of folks kind of, it seems obvious, but a lot of folks put that to the side, right? Uh, when they were kind of shoveling money out the door in, in the late 20 teens leading up to the end of 21 and, and are now saying, well, wait a second, actually, it's going to be many years until this thing, this technology, this, you know, this asset creates real cash flow. No one really values that cash flow relative to hard cash flows they have. And by the way, whatever cash flow it might have had uh, or even does have relative to alternatives or risk-free, now that risk-free is fundamentally changed, right, is relatively unappealing. And so, you know, what was I thinking, right? Uh, and 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 I think, uh, you know, the hallmarks of, of kind of multi-decade, highly successful investors are you know that kind of dispassionate look at um again what is the what is the basic understandable yield that is derived from this thing and how and and it doesn't mean again that whole buffett munger uh, issue of you know a, a you know buying a great business at a good price versus buying you know basically cigarette butts that both can work um one could argue even that um you know uh the the mechanism by which you know Buffett and Munger did the the former, you know, it was powerful, right? You sit on your hands and you have you own a bunch of money machines, you pay the premium for them, but they keep working for you and they keep working over time, over time and memorial. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and or you can create kind of a cigarette butt buying machine, right? Which in some ways we've done, um, and 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 effectively make tried to make our enterprise itself um, a good, um, highly free cash flow generative enterprise with moded with a moded franchise. But it just depends. So in the current market, are, are there particular areas that you think are, are very appealing? Sure. I think, well, I, I would look at the market um, as a kind of uh, a, a group of different opportunities. And I think if you want to create a scaffolding upon which you could kind of hang your perception of where opportunities are and aren't or might be, I personally think about First off, the combination of the um, tremendous uh, asset bubble that was created starting in 2012 with um, the introduction of QE2, which is really the wholly unnecessary and, and highly inappropriate, uh, um, effectively, intervention in the market by the monetary authorities to suppress rates at a time when it wasn't really an emergency and it wasn't really appropriate. Um, and that created, of course, what is now the largest asset bubble that's ever been. And then starting in 2020, um, you know, and starting in our country, but in many countries around the world, we really saw a, a significant increase in the degree to which there was a wholesale governmental commitment to the destruction of, of, of fiat currencies. Um, you know, obviously, again, going back to Munger, show me an incentive and I'll show you an outcome, right? What do monetary authorities want to do? They want to leave a good legacy and get a lot of sinecures and, and pass off the problems to the next guy. And what do politicians want to do? They want to get elected, period, full stop, and they'll mortgage the future and their grandkids and our grandkids' uh, futures for that purpose. And so as a result, you have uh, basically the 
consequent inflation that um, has kind of er arose for the first time in many years, mixed with high rates. And you have a high likelihood, given the degree to which the tools that the monetary authorities would otherwise be able to use through either QE uh, or uh, a lack of uh, or a recognition of the lack of inflation kind of gone now. And so you have a high likelihood of what is now called higher for longer, a higher for longer combination, not only of rates, but also inflation. Um, as the government wants to inflate as much as it, as it reasonably can without causing, you know, problems on getting elected in order to decrease the amount of liabilities that is already incurred by having this kind of asset, asset explosion that it created. And so what that means, of course, is um, in, in real estate terms, cap rates need to be higher, right? And values need to be lower. And on corporate terms, uh, valuation multiples are going to be lower, right? And so that creates two broadly defined two big opportunities uh, that we that we um, uh, colloquially refer to on uh, as a barbell. On the right side of that barbell are opportunities to be a beneficiary of the wholesale rationalization of the balance sheets of corporate property and, and, and structured assets all around the world, right? Uh, as And they may be very reasonably well-performing ones, but they were just bought at too high a price, lent to at too high a level, and therefore that needs to end right and it will end as an arithmetic fact of the matter and you're seeing that in many areas on the left side of the barbell you now have opportunities to re-enter markets that were really abused uh, by the whole scale uh, explosion in alternative assets where again the incentive was let's accumulate assets as fast as possible let's deploy them as fast as possible let's raise the next fund as fast as possible and you know we'll, we'll deal with it at the end right and so now you can re-enter those markets where the return point of risk is far more favorable as a number of those competitors have either kind of overdone it or otherwise, you know, you know, reduce their kind of um, participation in the market. Then the question is, where is that, where are the elements of that barbell happening? I would argue to you that that there has been a slow moving uh, kind of process by which different investment areas or even geographies have been more affected by some hard catalyst that precipitated a recognition of this kind of value value disparity that has been created in the marketplace because left to their own devices, no one will ever volunteer that they made the mistakes that they did, right? So in, in late 21, first off, we had the, the, the factors of the matter kind of arise in, in the growth and venture world, right? And so why is that? Because people actually needed cash because they were burning cash. And so that forced the recognition of, hey, there's a problem, right? And so we saw the barbell opportunities emerging of the small number of enterprises who had feasted on negative cost equity, who had built actual franchise value and, even, and maybe even cash flow positive, who were much lower value than they were before, but might actually provide new opportunities to invest equity or debt at much more favorable terms. You saw the left side of the barbell where the bar to raise, you know, uh, seed series A and series B was much higher. Therefore, the asymmetry and the potential investment in venture debt, where I know you're involved is uh, much more favorable, right? Much more in favor of the investor. And then in the middle of the barbell, we saw what a uh, venture capitalist recently referred to as a mass extinction event, right? Because on the one side, you didn't make it to the other side of having real brand value franchise, uh, you know, and, and franchise cash flow positive and, and kind of ubiquity of some sort. And you're not one of the shiny new baubles with the the two the two new magic letters A and I near them, right? And so no one cares, right? And yeah. so if you're Bitcoin or nano or blockchain or uh, some other form of yesterday's news, well, no one wants to know you anymore. And so there's there, all of those enterprises are getting obliterated, right? Um, because no one cares. Um, number two, I thought in 2022, we saw in the funds universe where the beginning of a new secular and very compelling investment opportunity, which is that as a result of this gorging on alternative assets, Never before have as many institutions owned as much uh, as much of a volume of LP investments across the entire um, you know alternative and even long only universe. And so that has meant as they realized, well, wait a second, these assets can have a much greater duration than I ever imagined. Right? Uh, suddenly they said, well, how am I going to service my uh, you know my my annual draw as an endowment or my uh, you know premium you know, uh, you know uh, the insurance settlements uh, as an insurer or the you know, pension obligations or whatever, what have you, and started to start selling or start to rationalize a lot of their portfolios. That's in the very 
you know, if if the growth thing is in the bottom of the first, the LP stuff is in the top of the first. It is a massive, massive opportunity. And there's it's not an asset class, even though our space loves to slap the term asset class on virtually everything it can, because any kind of productization uh, opportunity is is a is another way to sell something. And so the reality is it's just another way to wrap collateral, right? It's just it, and basically we see a lot of these uh, large scale allocators in some ways as banks that have to rationalize their balance sheet. And instead of owning loans on these assets, they own LP interest in them. And there's gonna be a tremendous amount of opportunity around that. Number three, starting, uh, you know, call it eight months ago, we saw things like Silicon Valley Bank and, and First Republic where people said, well, wait a second, suddenly my deposits can move around in a way I never thought. Uh, they're not as stable. And by the way, in the wake of the over and misregulation of the banking system post the GFC, uh, we were all told to invest in securities and real estate loans, right? Because that was safe, right? And so, of course, they went way long uh, in order on their securities in order to kind of reach for yield and, and subject themselves to interest rate risk to, to staggering proportions. And on the real estate side, they overdid it uh, too much advance to uh, not the right borrowers, et cetera, et cetera, with a highly exposed rate risk as well, that was harder to understand, right? So in, if I'm buying 15 year bonds, most people can go, well, wait a second, if rates change, there's gonna be a heck of a heck of a change in the values, which is why you see large scale banks with hundred billion dollar, not you know, mark to market losses that they've not recognized. Um, on the real estate side, it was a little harder to discern, which was uh, in addition to the obvious secular issues that we have in office in certain parts of retail, we have this cap rate issue, right? Which is effectively an interest rate risk that wasn't hedged, right? And so as rates are perceived to be uh, higher for longer, cap rates higher, values lower, advance rates too high, uh, and effectively there's impairments. They haven't been recognized in many instances, but I think you will see that coming. Again, barbell, right side of the barbell, you're gonna see huge amounts of distress, a lot of loans coming off the of balance sheet, as well as out of alternative investors who themselves have finance themselves frequently on, an, on a non-asset liability match basis with Wall Street uh, rediscount lines of sorts. And uh, on the left side of the barbell, you're going to see new issue opportunities, and we're seeing them today that are exceptional, right? Where uh, effectively, you know, everybody, you know, you're generically, you're looking at straightforward real estate where three years ago, people were advancing 80% on a five cap asset and a five-year deal to make 6%. And now they're doing... 65% on an eight cap asset on a two year deal to make 13, right? And then even risk free adjusted, you know, the spreads have increased significantly and are very, very favorable and, 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 and have the additional benefit of being relatively more homogeneous, easy to effectuate and scalable. So we like that a lot. Next corporate, right? And so just beginning, literally at the very beginning, um, uh, you know, the markets were Markets are always, uh, market participants are always innovative around um, effectively hiding uh, price discovery, right? Uh, market participants hate price discovery, right? So as an example, in we have talked to uh, bank lenders who have said, look, I'm not sending my bad real estate loan to the workout department because that means that they'll have to, that'll trigger an appraisal and then we'll have to mark the loan. Right. And then we're going to have to put up more capital against it. It'll be ROE negative and that'll be bad. Right. And so similarly on the corporate side in leverage loans, uh, unfortunately, it was not well recognized. The interconnection between CLO, CLOs, leverage lending, direct lending and middle market private equity. And basically the fundamental mis-selling of leverage loan performance based on a rear view mirror 60 percent recovery post GFC was used to sell CLO interests that uh, effectively, uh, when paired with very low cost AAAs from large scale global insurers, uh, created a tidal wave of, of lending desire, right, which meant that people were lending more, earning less with worse covenants and funding private equity sponsors who were then able to pay more, right? Assuming you know long uh, a, a, the availability of very cheap debt. And so, that created debt that was much worse in quality than it was pre-GFC, which will likely have recoveries that look like more like 30 than 60, which means that this whole thing is going to unwind the other way, right? And so now there have been a whole series of different mechanisms in the marketplace, like the control of leverage loan information um, limited only to people who are already in the loan, 
right? So therefore it's hard for new people to buy and therefore hard to, for new people to price or things like what they call white lists where only certain people are allowed to ever buy the loan, right? Again, precluding people from pricing the loan or different agreements among lenders where they say, no, we're all going to sell together or not. So again, stopping sale, right? And so uh, as Ben Graham and Buffett and Mark tell you, in the short term, the market's a voting machine. In the long term, it's a, it's a, yeah, sorry, in the short term, it's a way, it's a voting machine. In the long term, it's a weighing machine. And so all of this will come home, right, to, to, to roost. And this whole kind of cycle uh, is unwinding itself and it'll be precipitated by, I would guess, the agencies, right, where uh, unlike uh, value investors in credit who think about leverage uh, and severity, uh, agencies and banks and regulators think about defaults and coverage. Why don't we care about defaults? Well, defaults are not losses. They're just defaults. And if you make really hard covenants, you're going to have lots of defaults. And that's okay because you're going to have less losses. And in the case of, you know, why do we care about leverage and not coverage? Because we want to lend as little as possible and make as much as possible. And coverage really means how much, how much does the cash flow of an asset cover your interest, right? And so if we charge really low, we get a very, very low rate, we can create very high coverage levels, right? And so that doesn't make any sense because we want to charge high rates and have low coverage levels. And so what's happening is now with the increase in risk-free, the agencies who focus on coverage are saying, wow. There's a lot more, there's a lot less coverage of cash flow on these now escalated rates. We're going to downgrade, which then in turn creates uh, the possibility of effectively uh, forcing um, long only and other alternative types to put more capital against these assets, which then effectively creates a pricing mechanism. Finally, recognizing, of course, that in most instances, the agencies are plus or minus 18 months late to any party uh, with regard to credit quality. And then finally, uh, in structured finance, we've seen tremendous changes in delinquency rates. Again, a whole a variety of ways and reasons why those are not marked appropriately. Uh, but you know, those are chickens that are coming home to roost as well. If you look at where uh, payment, uh, you know, kind of um, payment data regarding unsecured credit cards, car loans, residential mortgages, et cetera, et cetera, and that's as well as other non-consumer structured finance assets. So that's what's happening. There's a lot to dig into there. <laughs> so, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about real estate and commercial real estate and what that means for for bank balance sheets and what that could mean for capital availability. And, and, sure. and so, in simple terms for people, how would you frame it out in terms of the pressure on commercial real estate and what's been happening to date, and also what's going to change in the sense that valuations are going to have to start to to change. Um, you know, clearly, a lot of people have been finding ways to avoid marking their books to the true market value, but that can't persist forever. So, yes. so very simple terms, how, how do you think that the commercial real estate um, sector will impact bank balance sheets and what will that mean for the broader economy? Well, it is interesting because this uh, CRE has found itself into many different nooks and crannies within the overall marketplace. And um, not in obvious, in a lot of non-obvious ways, meaning Yes, of course, post GFC, the banks were all told to do CRE lending, so they did it. Well, but also there were global um, investment trusts of various sorts with daily liquidity that invested in huge amounts of uh, commercial real estate, right? Even though it was completely illiquid and levered to the hill, right? And you're seeing certain headlines now of folks in Europe who, uh, you know, were involved in some of those things. Um, furthermore, within the alternative space, um, the uh, alternative marketeers came up with this fabulous term called core, which was called, you know, in, in, in today's language would be thought of as a dog whistle for low risk, right? Uh, if I call it core, the investors hear low risk, low risk, low risk, right? And so they bought really high quality real estate or what they perceived to be high quality real estate at the time at incredibly high prices or low cap rates. They finance it with tremendous amounts of leverage at, at what was then low rates, right? And then proceeded because of the asset independent of its price or capital structure to call it core, right? And so people then said, well, if I'm buying something that's core in a low rate environment, if I make 6% net to me, I should be super happy. And now lo and behold, they weren't thinking, by the way, I have, I'm going to make 6%, but my downside is I'll lose all my money, right? They were thinking very little downside because- that dog whistle allowed them to think in their heads, kind of, they owned a great asset, never mind the price exactly. And I'm not exactly sure how the leverage works, right? But it'll be okay. Because it 
After all, it's called core. Um, and so all of those chickens are coming home to roost because the values are different. And um, and by the way, they came home to roost. The value diminution started, you know, two or three years ago with COVID um, and, and the kind of fiscal destruction that began in early 2020. But again, finally, people are forced to recognize it, right? And it's, you're seeing it in these trusts. You're seeing it in the, the beginning of the accumulation of reserves at banks. You're seeing it in the um, in certain types of REITs that have halted uh, redemptions uh, because of these issues. And you're seeing it begin in CMBS prices. So it's kind of creeping out in, in all of the little cracks that it was stuffed into, right? It's still very early. Um, and as I said, it, as an example in the US on the banking side, on the new issue lending side, the banks have already kind of made themselves scarce and there's wonderful opportunities in that regard. On the right side of the barbell where you're talking about the rationalization of those assets, that kind of hit their radar um, uh, late, uh, kind of recently enough that they weren't in a position to be able to continue to report earnings, that strong earnings, while also taking those losses. So what you're, and I think we've already started to see major banks who, um, uh, who surprise, surprise, have reported really strong earnings, but uh, greater reserves than they were expecting. Well, that's not a that's not a big mystery, right? So they're going to continue to make you know, net interest margin on all of their assets as much as possible, build up those reserves that'll then allow them to take the, those losses while they still kind of manufacture earnings that you know seem steadier than they really are, right? If you were hard marking the market. It would be, you know, very brutal because obviously banks are, you know, call it between 10 and 20x levered, right? So that means small changes in underlying asset values can be very material. And furthermore, they've had the additional problem of, oh, by the way, the market used to value my demand deposits higher than my term deposits because they had historically stayed longer than the term, right? But when you and I can move where I where you put your deposits at the at the kind of push of a button on the iPhone, suddenly that changes things a lot, right? Because now the right side of my balance sheet is completely destabilized, and I've got I'm loaded with these assets here over here that are now worth a lot less, right? And so that whole process is beginning to to show itself, and there are versions of that um, internationally. I would say much more so generically in Europe for all of this. Uh, you know, do we see things that are similar to the U.S.? I think. Asia Pacific, for a variety of reasons, is going to be delayed, but it's coming for it, it'll be coming there, you know, in six to 12 months, in our view. You hit on a, a great point about the, the velocity of, of movement uh, in the sense that uh, of cash movement, in that in the past, bank runs you know, were, were easier to kind of quell. And mm -hmm. now they can happen literally overnight, like they did with SVB, because social media gets a hold of a story. People can log into their you know, iPhone or computer and you know, press a couple buttons and voila, all those deposits are somewhere else. And I think that's a real risk that nobody, well, nobody on the regulatory side really anticipated or, or did anything to, to mitigate. Mm -hmm. So that that's definitely something that's changed structurally that then impacts you know, the speed that these bank runs can, can occur at. Um, one of the things I was wondering as well is you, you touched upon, we're talking a lot about liquidity. And I think that people who have liquidity or funds that have liquidity, institutions that have liquidity, are going to be in a very advantaged position going forward, in my view, because I think liquidity is going to dry up a, a lot. Um, certainly, I think most people are not ready for how much liquidity is going to be sucked out of the system. So how do you think about um, liquidity as being a tool to generate you know, high returns you know, versus just being smarter or being a better forecaster or being a better picker of industries or, or companies? Yeah, look, I think um, we look at the, again, goes back to what we talked about with regard to assets, on the underlying assets themselves and the degree to which they produce cash flow, right? When something produces cash flow, the pressure on me to kind of gain liquidity is a lot lower, right? Because it's producing cash flow, right? And if I have a pool of assets that themselves produce cash flows that are as uncorrelated to the overall market as possible and as uncorrelated with, amongst one another as possible, then I certainly have a base upon which to work. I would say we look to that underlying kind of uh, cash flow production capability. And so uh, we would, we're very focused on um, 
uh, kind of intrinsic duration, right? So uh, having the duration equa equation kind of move to our side, meaning we're one of the other many unintended consequences of the GFC and the bubble that ensued post that was that duration was systematically underpriced. Uh, and so, and, and there are some structural reasons why there are perceptions among certain types of, as an example, life insurance investors that they, uh, they tend to care much more about reinvestment risk than they care about duration risk. Uh, and so that leaves them leaning one way, so to speak. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we're going to, we're going to lend, uh, you know, with tight maturities and tight covenants and the ability to, uh, access assets quickly and monetize them quickly. Um, and we're going to demand that access and, and effectively charge a very high premium for, uh, uh, for quote unquote illiquidity. Um, I think there's going to be a recognition in the market. Uh, uh, it's ironic that there's still a great perception that, that you know, again, dog whistle core means risk-free and QSIP means liquidity, right? And again, for your listeners to be clear, a QSIP is something that is put on top of a security equity or debt or preferred that allows it to trade on a market. And so just because a thing is permitted to trade on a market doesn't mean it will trade on a market. Uh, and so, uh, and furthermore, just, just because something trades on a market doesn't mean it'll always trade on a market. Uh, in fact, it will, there are many assets that will trade on a market during good times, but will suddenly not trade on a market during bad times, right? And so one of the additional many unintended consequences of the over and misregulation of the banking system post the GFC which it, was that banks were penalized for providing market making, right? And again, for your listeners, what does market making mean? Meaning I, you need people sitting in the middle of markets saying, I will buy and sell in order to facilitate that liquidity, right? And yes, in you can use dark pools and, and technology and make that work in a lot of stock situations, although not all, uh, much harder in fixed income. And you know, fixed income is much bigger. Uh, and so I think there is a significant left tail risk that um, if something unexpected happens in the markets, we may have a effectively a ceasing of, of the provision of liquidity over an extended period of time, like we had in the back half of 98 in the wake of the Russian default and the Thai bot crisis uh, in Asia. Um, and then furthermore, uh, ironically, we may see some liquidity pop up that we didn't know we had. So uh, while certain fixed income instruments that have QSIPs may not have liquidity, what we're seeing is uh, ever more uh, liquidity available in what are regarded as purely private assets through the secondary markets, right? Because there's been an unbelievable amount of capital raised by some of the very same people who were incredibly aggressive during the bubble um, to then go and buy their theirs and others LP interests that were aggregated during that bubble. And so as an example, you might be uh, on the board of an endowment and say, well, the NAV statements on our CRE equity say that they are at, you know, 0.8 of our original uh, commitment level. But you might see that the secondary market for that very same LP interest is trading at 50 cents on that 80 cent dollar, right? On that 80 cents. And so at some point, one, you're going to see a lot more of this trading of these interests, right? Some very significant endowments have engaged in these transactions already at levels, you know, significantly below NAV, the stated NAV of the, from the general partners. And, uh, and consequently, you see a world where that which is perceived to have liquidity doesn't, and that which is perceived to not have it does. Right. And so a lot of secular changes are happening as a result of the kind of intervention in markets and as well as the evolutionary alternative space that kind of create new ways of looking at things.